All right, hi, welcome everyone to our talk on the San Francisco municipal flag, its history and a potential new design. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. This event has been produced in partnership with the San Francisco Historical Society and the Department of Memory, which is a grassroots group of independent historians who organize the annual history festival here in the city, San Francisco History Days. Maybe you've attended. Uh, it usually um, takes place in March. This year, however, you can guess why, it will take place uh, September 25th through September 27th. So if you are not friends on Facebook with SF History Days, uh, you should be. Anyhow, I work closely with both of these entities to provide exciting programming uh, of relevance to the Bay Area community. Now, today we have two speakers. We have John Lumia, who is a regular at Mechanics Institute. He is the founder of the Emperor Norton Trust, which is a nonprofit that works to honor the life and legacy of our city's fair emperor, uh, previously known as Joshua Norton. He's also a writer and an activist uh, with a demonstrable interest in history, uh, urban design, uh, and obviously flags. <laughs> uh, his work has uh, appeared in many local rags. Uh, you've probably also seen his most recent article in the bold italic. We also have uh, Brian Stokel, who is a bit of a unicorn in that he is a California native. He's also an urbanist, an advocate, and a cartographer, and a planner for the San Francisco uh, City Parks and Recreation Department. In his personal time, he works to design better flags. And for the last seven years, he's been laboring over a design for the San Francisco municipal flag, or just a flag. Um, anyway, after several iterations, we think he's got it right, and I hope that you think so too. He will present his design, the fog and gold flag, later for us today. Now, both of these gentlemen have robust online presences, and so I will link to their respective uh, websites in the chat room. And meanwhile, the um, way the event today will work is John will present and then Brian will present their research and then we'll start the Q&A. Um, since we have a large audience, please post your questions in the chat room and I will endeavor to fold them in to the conversation. Um, pay attention, however, to the uh, presentations because I suspect that a lot of your questions will be answered there. Meanwhile, Thank you so much, and uh, are you ready, John? I'm ready. Great. Am I, am I sharing now? You're sharing, we can see your uh, uh, seal. Excellent, excellent, good. Well, so, so this, is, this, is the, um, this is the original uh, seal of the city and county of San Francisco, uh, which is the one that we have now, uh, which was actually adopted uh, in 1859. Uh, this image is a very early one. Uh, that actually appeared in the Board of Supervisors Municipal Reports uh, of 1859-1860. So right after, right after it, was, it was adopted. And these seals are really important because very often in city flags, you know, the seals of the city uh, provide the visual resources for what goes in the flag. In fact, you know, many, uh, you know, very traditional flags are just simply the seal uh, slapped on a color and that's just what it is. Uh, so you see uh, in the original seal, uh, the phoenix there at the top, and the flames, uh, and then down there at the bottom, uh, you see the motto of the city, uh, Oro on Paz, uh, Fierro and Guerra, uh, which means uh, gold in peace, iron in war. And so if you fast forward to today, uh, you see uh, this is our current uh, municipal flag uh, with the phoenix uh, and the motto. Um, and one of the reasons why we're here today is that in the last several years, uh, there's been a sort of a growing appreciation for uh, the role that design plays uh, in enabling flags to do what they can do, uh, which is simply to uh, unify their populations and give them a place to sort of rally around. And, and part of what that means is uh, what maybe should go on the flag, maybe what should not go on a flag uh, to enable it to be its best self. Um, and the San Francisco flag that we have now uh, has evolved in some ways that, that, that don't let it speak 
uh, maybe as well as it might. Uh, and Brian is going to, going to uh, sort of speak to those issues. My job today is to really uh, give us some backstory as to exactly sort of how we uh, got here. So here uh, again is that seal. Uh, it seems that uh, there, there, are, there are newspaper records uh, of a city flag uh, in 1859, a, a separate civic flag uh, when David Broderick uh, died in the duel with uh, David Terry. There was a day of mourning in San Francisco on September 17th, 1859, and there are newspaper accounts of a separate city flag being hoisted from the top of City Hall. Uh, separate from the national flag, uh, there were other accounts from 1862 uh, saying that a new flag was, was about to be uh, sort of unveiled. Uh, but our story today really begins uh, in 1900. And it seems uh, that in about 1900, uh, the flag, uh, such as it ever was, had fallen out of disuse. And the mayor at the time, uh, James Phelan, uh, came in in 1897. And Phelan uh, had, had come to believe that San Francisco needed a new city flag, and he sort of championed this idea. Um, in early 1900, uh, Phelan submitted an article to a competition uh, from a publisher in Philadelphia uh, called How to Make Corporations Pay Their Taxes. And this, was, this article was sort of connected to, I think, the new city charter process that had been uh, going on in, in San Francisco at the time. Uh, he won the prize for the article, $150. Uh, and as soon as he won the prize, he sort of came back to San Francisco and said, you know what? Uh, we're going to have a competition, a civic uh, competition, a citizen's competition for a new flag design. And whoever wins, they're going to get the 50 bucks. So that's, that's sort of how he did it. And the competition uh, in the first um, few months actually was a bit of a bust. Uh, you know, there was, there was sort of um, open ridicule uh, in the papers. Uh, the, um, I've got a quote here from the... Um, the uh, SF Chronicle in, on March 17th, 1900, uh, wrote that, uh, quote, competitors may choose a guinea pig, a rat, or a monkey as the central figure. So that gives you some sense of, of how seriously the papers took it. Um, uh, but eventually the thing did uh, sort of seem to sort of gather some steam. Uh, but on March 30th, there was initial unveiling of the, of the 100 designs that had been submitted. Uh, and they were sort of all over the board, and none really rose to the level. And it seems that the, that the citizens, um, um, selection committee had not really put any limits on the designers to what they should be doing. Uh, and so they, they went for around two, uh, starting uh, on March 30th. And at this point, the citizens committee said, uh, okay, the flag has to have a white background. It can't be uh, more than two colors. Uh, it has to have a symbolism that is, that is specifically related to the city. Uh, and it has to have the motto. So they put some limits uh, on designers, and in doing so, they also singled out about 15 of the, of the competitors for special mention, basically saying, you know, these are, the, these are the ones that we sort of like, and we encourage you to sort of keep on uh, uh, working on your ideas. And one of, those, uh, one of those competitors was an artist named John M. Gamble. And John M. Gamble uh, was, a, was, a, was a young artist who was training in San Francisco. He had just recently returned from his tour of Paris, uh, and was really sort of on his way and, and later on um, went on to become a very well-known uh, California landscape painter, uh, sort of in, in the Impressionist uh, vein. Uh, that's what he was. And so uh, the competition sort of got restarted and Gamble uh, won the prize. And so this is, this is a sort of a staff artist rendering that appeared uh, in the SF Chronicle uh, of Gamble's uh, concept uh, on April 15th of 1900. Uh, here's another version that appeared, you know, very, very similar, uh, sorry, in the, uh, in the SF call uh, on the same day. Uh, and oh, let's see. And so, and so, so you have this, this flag uh, uh, that is attributed uh, to, to Gamble, but not really any pictures of it, uh, or at least they're very, very hard to find. One of the first pictures that, uh, that, that does uh, sort of bubble up from the surface, is this one. Uh, this photograph uh, came out in the October 29 issue of the Overland Monthly. And uh, Phelan, originally in 1900, had given the, the original San Francisco flag to uh, the police department for safekeeping. So they were the custodians of the flag. Uh, and eventually over the years, the flag had, had, got, had worn out, uh, had gotten deteriorated. 
um, some damage had happened to it, and so they had to create a new flag. And so the occasion for this article in the Oval Monthly uh, is that a replacement uh, copy uh, has been made. Uh, and in this article, we see one of the few uh, references uh, that credits uh, the design of this flag, uh, not to John Gamble, uh, but to Robert Ingersoll Aiken. Aiken was a contemporary of Gamble's, and he was, uh, he was an artist uh, in his own right, also trained in San Francisco, and, and in the next um, uh, couple of years after 1900, uh, he would go on to do his own uh, sort of Paris tour. Uh, he was a sculptor. Uh, and and uh, this is an image that appeared um, a few years earlier. Um, uh, this is just to sort of connect a few dots here. Uh, this is an image that appeared in a scrapbook put together by Hamilton Henry Dobbin. Uh, and Dobbin collected all sorts of newspaper uh, clippings and photographs of San Francisco of the day. Uh, and this particular scrapbook, which is in the California State Library, uh, the materials in it are dated to, to no later than 1927. So here you have that, you have that same uh, flag that was replaced uh, in 1929. Here's an image of it from no later than 27, which gives us the sense that, that, that we had basically the same flag uh, at least between 1900 and 1929. Uh, there's another article uh, in the SF Chronicle in 1925 uh, crediting this flag to, uh, to Aitken, uh, saying that he had, he had designed uh, the flag, uh, quote, before the fire. Um, so, so, so Aitken uh, starts sort of coming into focus. This image uh, is, is, the, is the image that appeared, uh, you know, back in April of 1900 uh, in the SF Examiner. Uh, and this is the one that is, that is most like uh, the design that we just now saw. Uh, and my my best guess is that what we're looking at here is is actually Gamble's competition and entry. So this is this is the design or this is the concept that he uh, drew himself. Um, so here's here's um, here's Aiken, uh, very well known in San Francisco uh, for having sculpted the victory figure uh, on top of Dewey, Dewey Monument uh, in Union Square. And so here's, here's Aitken in, in January of 1902 uh, designing uh, that figure. Uh, here's the completed figure uh, on top of uh, the Dewey Monument. Uh, Aitken is also uh, known uh, very famously for having designed uh, in 1935 the very famous uh, sort of Western uh, pediment, uh, sort of the main entrance to the U.S. Supreme Court building. In Washington, the pediment is the is the sort of the triangular uh, sort of shape uh, above the columns. Uh, inside that space, there are nine uh, sort of monumental uh, uh, figures uh, sculpted to represent different things, and 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 this was all uh, of Aiken's work. So he was a he was a very very well known sculpture sculptor. Uh, and so the question then becomes, well, how do we get from Gamble uh, to Aiken? And it seems like the, the link here is Douglas Tilden. This is Douglas Tilden. Uh, Tilden was a sculptor. Uh, he was a teacher at the Mark Hopkins Institute of Art. Uh, he was a mentor to Aitken. Uh, and, and he uh, was, was very famous in his own right. Uh, Phelan, uh, at that point, uh, was, was very well known not only as the mayor, but also as, a, as an arts patron. Uh, and so, Fe so Phelan was, was Tilden's uh, main uh, sort of patron. And, uh, and Tilden, uh, with, Phil, with Phelan's help, uh, sculpted uh, the Admission Day Monument, which is at uh, uh, Market Street and Montgomery and Post. Very familiar to many of you. He also sculpted uh, the Mechanics Monument uh, on Market Street uh, at Battery. Uh, and my, my best guess is what is happening here, because Phil, Tilden would have known uh, who both Gamble and um, Aiken were. And my best guess is that, that, that Gamble uh, created the concept, but it still needed to be realized as a design. Uh, and Gamble wasn't really a designer. He was an artist. He was an impressionist painter. Uh, but, but Aiken was someone who, who really had the design skills uh, to really sort of bring that into something that was more refined and could be used uh, in a flag. Um, 
We don't have very many uh, photographs of that early flag. This is one of the few. Uh, this is from 1915. Uh, this is the um, this is uh, December of 1915, uh, opening day of the new uh, city hall. And you see there on the left are the American flag, and to the right uh, is that is that um, is that original uh, San Francisco flag. Uh, here's another photograph uh, from October of 1920. Uh, this is from a, from an official um, uh, SFPD uh, um, sort of uh, inspection and review uh, that was held every year uh, at City Hall. It may still be, I don't know, but, uh, but you see uh, the flag there uh, on the right, uh, sort of midfield. Um, and it seems like what, what happened in these years was that even though the, you know, this flag was was presented and designed as, as the city flag, it really was sort of adopted as the police department flag. It was only brought out on, on official occasions uh, when there would be sort of a presentation of the color. And so it was really functioning uh, more as the police flag uh, than it was uh, the city flag. And in those years, you know, didn't really have uh, city flags anywhere um, uh, that were, uh, you know, flying from buildings of flagpoles. If you had a flag flying, it was going to be, you know, the American flag, the national uh, sort of banner. So that's, that's in 1920. But this photograph from 1915, uh, this shows um, Mayor uh, James Sonny Jim Rolfe uh, dedicating a new uh, firehouse uh, at Commercial and Drum Street, uh, replacing one that had burned down in 1906. And you see the banner behind him on the right. Uh, this is an SFPD. Uh, flag that, that, of course, looks very, very different uh, to, to what the city flag uh, had been and what, and what the SFPD was using. You see a much more traditional uh, heraldic uh, sort of um, uh, phoenix there, and, and, the, and the, um, the, uh, the motto is, is in a very different uh, sort of configuration. Uh, if you fast forward, and so there's, that, there's the city flag again from 1900. Uh, here's the one the SF Fire Department was using. Um, and by the time you get to 1928, uh, this, is, this is one of those same annual uh, review uh, ceremonies at City Hall. Uh, the flag there on the right is the police department flag. It's a little hard to make out in this photograph, um, but you see there's kind of a bar across the top that actually says San Francisco, San Francisco the Police Department. Uh, and if you go to the, the essay uh, that I think Tara will have sort of linked uh, on the event page, there's some really nice large uh, versions of these photographs that will sort of enable you to really sort of focus in and sort of see uh, how uh, this thing is beginning to evolve. But here's a photograph from that same event. Uh, you can see a little bit better here that the shape of the phoenix is a little bit different. Um, here's an interesting event. Uh, this, is, this is the, uh, the inauguration swearing in of uh, Angelo Rossi uh, in January of 1931. Uh, and, and, and here you have two, two American flags on the right, and then on the left, and then on the right-hand side, there's a police department flag, and there's a fire department flag. There is no city flag. It's just, it's just those four flags. Uh, so it's a really curious thing, you know, given that we know that that original flag from 1900 was, was, was recopied uh, in 1929, but yet by, 19, by the late 1920s, uh, that flag seems to have been sort of ushered off to the side. Here's a, here's a tale from that same shot that gives you a little bit better idea of kind of how that um, phoenix is evolving and showing that it's, it's been uh, sort of uh, the police flag is what's, is what's being used there. Uh, this is an event uh, from, uh, from October of 1931. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, came to Rossi's offices at City Hall and presented him with three flags. Uh, an American flag, California flag, and there on the left, uh, a new San Francisco flag, which I hope you can see uh, really bears no resemblance at all uh, to what the city flag uh, had been. Uh, here's a photograph that shows uh, Rossi in his office on Inauguration Day, uh, January 1932, uh, with those same three flags uh, sort of behind him in a sort of a special uh, stand. Um, and again, you see uh, the Phoenix uh, is very, very different. It's very interesting to sort of think about sort of, uh, you know, what may have been happening here. You, you know, you're, you're looking at the late 20s, early 30s. Um, um, you know, the Great Depression is, is, is coming on. Uh, you've got uh, on the world stage um, uh, the Nazi Party, the Communist Party in Germany are, are consolidating power. 
uh, Hitler is rising. So it, it wouldn't be all that surprising that some may have begun to feel that this imagery uh, was, was not quite uh, American looking enough and that they were sort of reaching for something a little more traditional, a little more eagle-like. Uh, and so, so this is the image uh, that seems to have really sort of, uh, um, sort of come through uh, through the decade of the 1930s. So you still have the elements, you still have the phoenix, uh, the flames, uh, the motto, but, but, a, but a very, very different uh, sort of look. Now, Fast forward to 1938, there, there are a couple things going on here. Uh, San Francisco is preparing for uh, the Golden Gate uh, Exposition, which is gonna start in 1939. So they're expecting a lot of visitors. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a supervisor by the name of Adolf Schmidt, who has, um, who has uh, is spearheading lots of, uh, lots of city beautification projects in connection with this upcoming um, uh, arrival of, of all these new tourists. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is a new uh, Women's Chamber of Commerce group who uh, initially started out uh, doing a lot of events around commerce and industry. Uh, but by 1938, they're beginning to sort of expand their uh, remit and doing lots more um, sponsoring of, of civic uh, parades, patriotic events, you know, all of this uh, against the backdrop of what is happening uh, in Europe. And so it seems like um, that, that Schmidt and the Chamber of Commerce sort of made common cause and, and they supported one of those efforts. Uh, and it really was the Women's Chamber of Commerce that came along and they said, you know what? What this flag needs is the word San Francisco in bold letters uh, across this flag so everyone will know what, what it is. Uh, Schmidt, uh, you know, buys into this idea and becomes the champion. Uh, of, of that uh, in the War of Supervisors. And uh, in August of 1938, they passed a resolution, uh, beginning to sort of codify what this flag was gonna be, uh, and that from now on, uh, the flag was going to have uh, San Francisco across the bottom. It's not until December of 1940 uh, that there's, there's, there's an actual ordinance to that effect, uh, really sort of making this uh, law, uh, using the same uh, kind of language and what they specify in the resolution is, quote, a phoenix rising from the flames, below which shall appear the motto, or on paz, fiero, and guerra, both in a golden hue, with the flag itself bordered with gold. The word San Francisco shall appear horizontally along the lower portion of the flag, below the phoenix, and the motto uh, in letters of appropriate size, rich blue in coloring. And so we got that. So we went from here in the 1930s to this, basically the same flag. Um, and, and what seems to have happened is that that, that very uh, oblique uh, language, um, sort of talking about the, uh, the flag itself bordered with gold, the, atten the intention apparently, the consensus seems to be, uh, was for the flag to have what it had always had, which is an actual physical uh, gold fringe, uh, you know, made of fabric. Uh, but this was interpreted to mean an actual frame that was like sewn into the flag and then later on printed on the flag, which is what we, what we sort of now uh, recognize and been looking at uh, for the last uh, 80 years. Um, this flag uh, stayed pretty constant uh, through about uh, 2005. Uh, it began to get modernized. Was, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the flag. Actually, the flag here uh, was designed uh, by the... Uh, the Paramount uh, Flag Company. There were two main uh, sort of flag manufacturers in the city at the time, uh, the Paramount uh, Company and the Emerson uh, Flag Manufacturing Company. This is the Emerson design, uh, which has uh, some differences. You see the flames are, are sort of more curved and organic. Uh, the, 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 the Phoenix is a little bit different. Uh, the the, um, the model ribbon is, is in gold and the letters at the bottom are, are serif as opposed to being sort of a sans serif. Uh, design. Uh, it seems like uh, these two flags were being used sort of in parallel uh, through about the mid 1960s uh, when the mayor at the time, I believe George Christopher, uh, said, you know what, the Paramount flag, that's the, that's the one. So, uh, so that one is the one you sort of began to see. Uh, 2005, uh, this is a sort of a more modern interpretation uh, where you see the, the, uh, the phoenix is becoming a little more cartoon-like. The, the beak is sort of puffed out a bit more. Um, uh, there's, there's some little, little tweaks around the edges. Um, 
and then and then we get uh, this design, uh, which which came in uh, in 2008. This one actually you don't you don't really see on flags uh, at all. You see it on on um, letterhead and posters and, and various things like that. But one thing that 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 really happened here. You notice all along there's been that sort of ropey braided figure right right below the flames. That was always a uh, a part of the flag going back to 1900. In fact, it's a part of the of the, of the city seal, and it's a it's a it's a heraldic uh, element uh, that got taken out, uh, and then uh, the beak closes, gets a little more snooty, and so that's where we are uh, today, uh, which is a very different place than we were uh, in uh, April of 1900. So I'm going to pass over to Brian, and uh, he's going to. Uh, He's going to take us to the uh, to the future. All you. All right. Let me get this up. Thank you, John. Can you guys see that? There we go. All right. Thank you, John. Great introduction on the history. Thanks to the Mechanic Institute for uh, having us here. Um, so um, my story starts in around 2013. Here we go with the flag again. I think I'm gonna go through some basics of flag design, but I'm not gonna belabor it. Um, is this where we left off? Um, just so everybody knows, this isn't codified in any uh, legal sense, but there is the Vexillological Society that has put it together that a, a good flag should follow these principles. Keep it simple, maybe so a kid could draw it, make it meaningful, um, have two or three basic colors, no lettering or seals, and be distinctive or related. And I'd say, I'd note that in my opinion, the meaningful symbolism and being distinctive are the most, or related, are the most important, uh, followed by keeping it simple. What that means is that there's a few great flags in the world, like national ones, that actually break this. Um, I don't have the images, but I don't think many kids could easily draw the UK's Union Jack very easily but we might all admit that it's a bit distinctive and meaningful because it's about the unification of Scotland, uh, England, and Ireland. Um, so these are the principles, but uh, there's a number of flags that uh, will actually not meet all of these. So when, um, it's actually before the famous Roman Mars talk from 99% Invisible that uh, there was a bit of chatter on Twitter and I started thinking about, hey, what should, what are the basics of a new flag? Uh, it's about city pride and the current flag as uh, Roman Mars and we've all been discussing may need some help from a design standpoint. It's got too many words on it. You don't have the American flag with the words United States of America on it. Um, that would seem pretty silly. We know it's the American flag, it's a symbol. Um, and it was actually before the Roman Mars talk that the bold italic in 2012 showcased Shorty Fats's redesign of the flag. He kept the uh, uh, Phoenix motif and the motto and putting the words on San Francisco, but depending on the adjective you wanna use, he modernized it in some fashion. So that's in 2012. The next year, uh, partially in response to that blogger, or, or uh, internet personality, as some have called him, Burrito Justice said, hey, let's make it simple so a kid can draw it. So here's his rendition, keeping with the Phoenix thing, basically an update of the current flag. Um, and that's when I chimed in. I thought the Phoenix, yes, it's important, but let's not be beholden to a Phoenix. Maybe something totally reimagined would be good. Hey, there's fog and there's bridges. Why not use this T-shirt design, not mine, where you show some sense of flag, uh, some sense of fog and the Golden Gate Bridge or a suspension bridge motif. I never, uh, and that's about when I started dabbling with many different uh, ideas. And I focused on what I noticed physically about San Francisco 
um, was its fog, its bridges, its steep hills, as well as the bay and the ocean. Now there's places with all of those, but it's the combination of those that I'd say is symbolic to us and we experience and uh, is identifiable. So this is one of my earliest versions where I overlaid some sense of fog on the top with a very vague sense of a suspension bridge over water. Um, then I try to get a little creative, throw in the phoenix, the wavy lines or the fog. The red is actually a, almost, the background is a silhouette of the shape of the Golden Gate Bridge. And then the yellow started out as a pillar, but then it kind of transformed into the Trans-America Pyramid. But it, it, you know, some people said they liked it, but it never got anywhere that popular. And nor did these designs, this is more simple, with fog rolling over a golden hill for a golden history. This is, I kept trying to simplify it. This is a, a, the suspension span with a bit of fog covering it with the water and golden skies. I tried to go off, off totally designy, but then everybody's like, I love the design, but it doesn't mean San Francisco. And then I said, hey, let's make it as simple as possible. Fog, throw in a little bit of distinctive gold. I actually think this one works, whether it connects to people to San Francisco is an open question. Lastly, I saw a photograph online that showed a view of Ocean Beach. And I just said, I'm going to go full fog. And this is with the fog looking out to the ocean. So you've got a foggy sky, dark blue waters, and a gray sand, because Ocean Beach's not that, not that golden. The gold's just thrown in saying, hey, maybe it's sunset. We've got a golden history. But let's get back. In 2018, uh, so basically between 2013 and 2018, I was working on this. And then I saw John's article in 2018. And that was around, I was feeling like I was somewhat frustrated with my designs, even though I thought some of them looked all right. But then I thought, wow, that what you just heard from John, there's this amazing history of a previous flag. Yes, a phoenix and flame flag that we never really had seen before. And it resonated with me. And I thought, I'm not really that much of an artist. So I'm a good tracer. So I said, hey, I can use that, that phoenix and that flame. Those flames are amazing. So this was my first version of the fog and gold flag design back in, from May 2019. So I basically traced the exact shape of that 1900 flag, made the bird black, the flames red, and threw on a golden upper half for our gold rush history and fog for our, gold, our foggy weather. Um, it evolved with dabblings, with some other ideas, um, with different colors, uh, crimson bird, some orange, international orange flames. Oh, wait, maybe we could throw in some blue water. Um, I forgot to put the eye in on one of them. But some comments said, hey, the fog should go on top because the fog's up in the sky. So I went along with that and we made the flames a sort of international orange and the bird is a red crimson. Um, and before I got to the final design, I thought, you know, maybe that shape's not it. Maybe we should go all weird Phoenix, like modernize it. And I worked with a, a, another person on Twitter, uh, Comic Sans, and we dabbled with some flowery feathers. And I learned a lot about what beak shapes mean, whether they're a meat eater or a vegetarian. This is kind of a cross, I think. But um, it, ultimately, I dropped it. And then I came up with the final design in 2013, in 2019 on October, on Halloween. So here you have it. Um, the gray, as mentioned, is the fog, but it can double as iron from our motto. Gold for the gold rush, his origins, and also the motto. The flames are a little tip of the hat to the Golden Gate Bridge. And the bird is crimson colored, uh, whether you want to call that passion or the blood that's been spilled by many people in our country and our city for various causes and wars. The two things I, I, major things I changed were the eye and the, the back feathers. 
If you go back and forth, you can see the eye before was a little bit droopy and a little bit sad or angry. And then the feathers got a little bit bigger. I wanted it to have a little more open eye, maybe a little less mean looking. Um, and so I thought, hey, the best way to get this, we, we really should have a new flag. Uh, it would, we'd be more proud of our city and it could be flown everywhere, not just on City Hall. And uh, I originally planned to introduce it in January 2020. Some uh, family uh, personal issues came in and so I delayed it. Then COVID-19 came along and I thought, okay, wait, this must be really bad timing. Then I thought, wait, maybe this is the best timing. This is something to rally around. And so I called for folks who could pitch in to buy a flag and uh, I got 26 people to get it. We ordered 31 flags. And here you see the very first flag, full size, three by five feet going up uh, in the La Lengua near between Noe Valley and the Mission. Uh, and it, it, it brought, a, it didn't quite bring a tear to my eyes, but it's quite striking to see it in reality. And they're flying all over the city now. Um, and it really, to me, it represents history uh, with the golden origins and it honors the old Aiken flag and our Phoenix origins of the multiple fires from the 1850s, the 1906 fire, uh, but also other calamities, whether human or, or natural. Uh, it shows resilience of Phoenix is really saying, hey, we can get through this. And we're, we, we may have to go through some difficult change and it's civic pride. And that, mean, that, that has meaning now in our shelter in place COVID-19 world and in the struggles we're having with the, the Black Lives Matter and the police reform. Um, I do wanna note that, that I'm not beholden to this design, I'm proud of it, but um, it's got, I'm gonna end here soon. Uh, but there are other designs, Noah O'Brien, around the same time in 2015, designed the Rising Stripes flag. I think that flag is very handsome and it works. And uh, Neil Musset put together a flag using the city colors, black and gold, in, with a simplified phoenix on the front. Um, you know, and basically I'm selling the flag and distributing it. It's not so much, you know, to, it's not about making money. It's actually showing that there's a, it's a proof, a proof of, of work, and that uh, I do donate monies to charities. And I think a competition is ordered. Why, you know, let's get something going, whether it's by an organization or sanctioned by the city to select a city flag. By the way, on a side note, you know, they say a kid should be able to design it. This is my daughter's drawing of the phoenix. So yes, indeed. It is a little bit harder to draw, but they, like I said at the beginning, a phoenix is meaningful for this city. And uh, it's flying all over the city, whether draped over a balcony and a window on flagpoles all across the city. Um, a, a guy near Pine Lake Park just picked up his flag yesterday. So it's in the Sunset Parkway district. And uh, I just wanna thank everybody and um, you can, look more at the flag. And uh, if you're interested in purchasing one of various sizes, you can go to the website. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, that was interestingly dovetailed to John's, uh, to John's commentary. Um, well, we have a lot of interesting questions that I would love to pose to you. Um, the first question, came from Stardust Doherty, who was curious if there has ever been an attempt to change the motto from something so warlike. Maybe Brian, maybe John has the answer to that. Not that I've ever heard. Uh, not that I've ever heard. I mean, I, I think, I think one of the, one of the, one of the critiques probably is, is that it's, that it's not easily parsed <laughs> as a flag element, you know, just because it's, it's, uh, um, it's just most, most people don't really even know what it, what it is or what it means. But, um, but as far as I have ever known, I mean, that, that, that motto was there uh, in 1859, at least. Um, so, and it seems to have been there ever since on the city seal. 
Um, so yeah, I mean the I think the the um, I guess the, the the renovation of of, of City Hall, which took place when was that the the big the big renovation twenty what? Oh right, right. Just before two thousand, like late nineteen nineties, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I think the effort there was to was to really kind of draw out the the black and gold. I mean, I, I don't because I don't I don't think I think it was pretty late that, that the city of the War Supervisors actually you know officially made black and gold the official colors of the of the city, uh, and so there is that 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 gold and iron, black and gold, and then it's then it's reinforced on the on the. Uh, on the dome. Uh, one of the things I did not mention uh, in, in my presentation was, and you can't really see it because the the images are all, you know, black and white or sepia tone. But but the but the original the flag uh, was black and gold. It was mainly it was mainly sort of black phoenix and 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 there, but there were sort of gold accents in the in the in the flames and in the, the motto. So so that's how it presented. I'm always struck with how many ironworks there were in, in early San Francisco. One of them, in fact, called the Phoenix Ironworks, which was um, founded by a couple mechanics founders. <laughs> but, you know, for a time there was, I don't know, six or seven at least uh, blacksmiths yeah. with right. scale ironworks. Right, because, because I, the, the, the explanation that, that Phelan gave in, in um, in, uh, in 1900, as he was sort of explaining, uh, you know, the rationale of his new flag, and as, and as they were making their selection, uh, was that you know that, that gold sort of stood for prosperity and 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 and, and all of that, and, and and that iron, iron was really about about uh, courage and resolve, uh, and then and then later on, it also sort of got this meaning of of literal armaments <laughs> being made in the city. So that was part of it too. Uh, but, but I think the, the original idea behind, behind iron was a little more uh, poetic maybe um, than, than being specific to industry or arms or whatever else. Strength. Yes. <laughs> um, Steve Manier has a question. Is there an official or unofficial California convention that municipal flags should be seals with a white background? Not that I know of. That that flag should be. Yeah, yeah. No, I doubt it because like I grew up in Fresno, California, and they do not have the city seal on their flag. They do have the words Fresno on it. It seems to be a California tradition because our <laughs> state flag has the word California Republic written on it, um, as does San Francisco and a few other cities. Um, but I don't believe there's a convention with it. Uh, Lana Costatini has a um, has a request that you repeat the translation of the motto. Oh, it's it's uh, gold in peace, iron in war, and it's in Spanish. Yes, not Latin. <laughs> yes, that, that that's interesting. Um, how about from? Stardust Doherty again, are you aware of any San Francisco independence secession movements that involved flags? I, I thought that was all Sonoma. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are California ones that, that, that but I, but I've not, I've not really paid attention to, to any flags associated with them. You um, mean the, the bear flag? Uh, well, yeah, I guess that's, but, but even more recently, I mean, there there have been there have been efforts to to make California an independent country and, and all of that, but I don't know if there are flags associated with that. There probably are logos of some sort, but whether anybody has ever tried to really. There was also a flag that predates the uh, bear flag, to my knowledge. That it's all known either as the Pico flag or the Alvarado flag. It was a white field with a giant red star on it essentially saying that California was a lone star country breaking away from Mexico. And it was, a, to be fair, a hat tip to Texas, which had previously done a similar thing. It's quite simple and striking, um, but um, it never, the story on that's interesting. I don't know the details, but it didn't quite break away from Mexico at that time. Well, you know, that's interesting because I suspect that a lot of, uh people involved with the Texas independence uh, after they were retired came to California. Timing's about right. <laughs> um, 
Let's see. Noah Bryan says, asks, with call from the mayor of Salt Lake City to change their flag, do you have, do you have serious hopes that, that San Francisco will follow? And actually... I do. I'm, I'm a boat. I, I kind of think of that famous line of, uh, you know, have hope, but be a realistic. Uh, I'm not going to requote Casey Kasem here, but you know, about the stars and feet in the ground. But um, uh, I think that I'm using a, a combination of my experience with other efforts uh, that are less uh, symbolic is you need both the ground grassroots upswell of support for some kind of change as well as uh, uh, political leadership or symbolic top-down leadership to get this to happen now it, it won't likely work I, if in unto itself on either of those you need both and so my angle is to get this flag distributed everywhere and doing talks like this uh, to get uh, a focus on the need to change the flag. I've put forth this flag, the fog and gold flag. But I, honestly, I, I just, at the, my core, I just want a better flag that we can all be proud of. And that seeing these all over the city will make folks realize, oh, what is our city flag? Is it this one? I will always say this is unofficial. Uh, we could make it official or we could have a common competition of some sort with a panel we can all be comfortable with that honors the city's uh, diverse history. And uh, I, you know, that there were Native Americans here before us and Spanish and Mexicans. And uh, we've got many things in our history and many things to be proud of about our city. You can't necessarily put all of it into one flag, but let's put it out there. There's a lot of creative minds out there and I'm sure there's something that I'm going to go, oh my gosh, that's even better than my design. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited by the um, prospect of the city rallying around a new flag. You know, in fact, I'm sure you're familiar with Jeremy Fish's design, little posters that he's been putting around in North Beach. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I just glanced at it and I thought, wow, that's interesting that I'm seeing this that I'm recognizing it now when we are hosting this talk today. Um, sure. but I, I thought that was a great way to just rally people and get people excited about their neighborhood and their, you know. Jeremy, actually in the, in the, in the, in the immediate wake of the Roma Mars uh, talk, which got so much attention in March of 2015, uh, San Francisco Magazine did its own uh, sort of unofficial, uh, you know, they asked uh, four different uh, designers and artists to, to sort of do their own sort of ideas. And Jeremy Fish was kind of part of that, uh, that, uh, that initial effort. So he's, he's, he has been specifically uh, sort of interested in, in, in the flag as well. Cool. Um, yeah, well, we'll see where that goes. Um, Lana Costantini has another question. She says that the international orange of the flames in your flag does not seem to match the orange of the Golden Gate Bridge. How did you match the color? So there's two pieces to that. One is that international orange, if you go to Wikipedia, there's actually three colors that are offered there. One of them is blaze orange that you often see for safety. That's very orange, but bright. The international orange we see on the bridge, like you've seen, is it, it's got a more of a red hue to the orange. What's interesting is I did pick the color and two things happen. Firstly, is that the color, when you place it on different materials, expresses itself differently. So the California Historical Society on Mission Street painted its building in international orange, but to my eyes, it looks a bit more orangey than the Golden Gate Bridge's reddish orange, while it's technically the same color. So part of it's about, well, what do you put it on? But truth be told, the color that I picked is not technically international orange. It's a slight deviation from it. And that, the reason for that was the contrast. Uh, and that's one of the struggles, I'll be frank, the, and it, I've received comments about this, is that the contrast of the flag is a little, you know, it's not as contrasty as it could be. Um, but I focus more on the symbolism and some of the logic of having the fog on top 
and the gold, a gold foundation on the bottom. Uh, that created, having orange on gold is less contrasty, so I had to tweak the orange, international orange, to be slightly more contrasty with the gold, and then the crimson to contrast with the fog gray. Um, but I, I, I could go back to a black bird like the old flag, you know, but this is what it is for now. <laughs> well, I think technically a phoenix is supposed to be red or gold or, you know, if, if yeah. we want to ask, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia, I'm sure they're going to say a phoenix should be red or gold or yeah. flame colored yeah. somehow. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say, I enjoyed the, uh, the punk rock phoenix, you know, San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, that connects with San Francisco's musical past, right? Yes. <laughs> Now that we have a question for John, can you recall what the oldest example of the city seal is or was that well, you were one that I showed at the, at the front of the, uh, of the presentation uh, is is the one that appeared uh, on the the SF Board of Supervisors Municipal Reports of 1859-60. Mm -hmm. uh, there used to be uh, I, I've not found it on the current city website, but there was an archived version of the city website that used to have a whole page about the seal and the history of the seal. Uh, and, and on that page, uh, you know, that's where they say uh, that, that there, was a, there was an earlier seal uh, from 1852. Uh, and I think that was before it was officially, corporately, the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, but, and, that, and that seal, according to the city's description, was, was a little bit more like the current, uh, the current uh, state of California seal. Uh, there was uh, a phoenix on it. It was on the bottom, uh, and uh, but but the one the one that is that is in that in that uh, reports uh, document from 1860, uh, you know, given that the city uh, adopted its seal uh, in 1859, should be pretty much what they adopted. Interesting. Well, I'll keep an eye out for that. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I, and I've not, I've not been able to find any images or artistic representations of what of what that civic flag uh, might have been like. My guess is that it probably would have been simply the seal on a solid field, but I don't know that. Um, hmm. Hmm. Um, Stardust uh, Doherty has another question. Uh, she brought this up right away in the chat. This was, I don't know, maybe the first third of your presentation, John, but you showed a um, a visual of the fire departments and multiple flags. This was in the 1920s, I think. And it right. appears, it couldn't be the 1920s, but probably the 30s, but it appeared that there was a swastika on the left side. That's right, that's right. And I, ha I haven't, that, that was the, that was the, um, that was um, the photograph of, uh, of Sonny Jim Rolfe uh, dedicating a new uh, replacement firehouse uh, in 1915, uh, and someone else may may know the history. I mean, I, I know that that the, that the swastika sort of took on new meaning uh, in the 30s, uh, and we we always associate it now uh, with um, with Nazi element and all of that. But but I think I think in an earlier time the swastika didn't have that meaning. Uh, but I did notice it. It's, it's a whole sort of floral uh, stand there with a swastika sort of in flowers. It's, uh, it's definitely jarring to see. Weird. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Uh, let's see but, here. But, but, but just to say that the swastika, the swastika is, is actually a very, very old folk symbol. It's not, it didn't originate uh, in Nazi Germany. It's, it had been around for a very long time. It was something that, that they adopted as their symbol, but it had been around for much, much longer than that. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Carolyn has a question. An older version of Phoenix, Arizona's flag looks very similar to the early San Francisco flag. Was there any, is there any connection or no? <laughs> I think that need to be researched. It does look strikingly similar. Mm. Not to the Aitken design, but to the 1930s, essentially the current design. But they changed that in 1990 to their more um, uh, burgundy or uh, crimson background with the white phoenix head. Right. 
and if you think about if you think about the, the United States seal, you know, with with the eagle there, you you have that you have that heraldic uh, bird figure that figures in many many seals. You know, that even even when the when the bird is not phoenix. Uh, so I think in a lot of ways, you know, what to my eye, uh, what started happening in the 30s is that the bird that was adopted was was actually less phoenix-like, uh, even though they kept flames underneath it. And the flames got more and more stylized. It's got, it has that kind of crown figure now that's kind of below the, the phoenix. But um, but yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if Phoenix, Arizona actually has the uh, the history of fires like San Francisco does. And you know, the phoenix was used in in on Roman coinage because ancient Rome was burned many many times and had had a lot of simil similarities to San Francisco's history. It, you know, there like are rogue fire companies and stuff. <laughs> I, I would add there's three major cities in the United States that have Phoenix on their seals or flags. And that's San Francisco, Phoenix, Arizona, and Atlanta, Georgia. Um, depending on what you think happened first or who cares what happened first, uh, you know, Atlanta and San Francisco kind of have it can duke it out on who's first, but um, I don't think it really matters. But um, Phoenix never actually burned. It was about a, a Native American civilization that uh, was lost and nobody knows what happened to them. Mm. Um, and so when they restarted the community, they said, hey, we're re it's a rebirth of this community in this location, even though it's European settlers. Let's call it Phoenix. And then Atlanta burning during the Civil War. Right. right. So I think San Francisco clearly is the winner here. <laughs> <laughs> I think they all can have phoenixes on them. Good. One thing I didn't mention, Wes, I love flags of all different types. And I think the star, for example, is a great symbol. But it's on so many flags that if you might have noticed, none of my designs, whether they were hideous, or compelling had a star on them because I think that symbol is overused and it is not unique, even though it's an important symbol to have a star. And while I think of Phoenix, although it's not truly unique to be on the San Francisco flag because of the other two major cities and there's about a half dozen other small cities like Lawrence, Kansas and Portland, Maine that have a Phoenix on them, although Portland looks more like a seagull, um, that, uh, I think the Phoenix is still very distinctive, relatable, and relatively unique. Yeah, I, I agree. Go ahead, John. No, I just, I don't want to cut you off. I had a quick footnote, but on a different subject. Let's, let's, hear, let's hear the footnote. I didn't include it in, in, in the talk, but, but people may, may wonder, you know, whatever happened to that 1929 flag? Uh, the, uh, the police department kept that 1929 copy of the 1900 flag. Um, and in 1952, the city uh, conveyed that physical flag, uh, or by order of the city, uh, the flag was conveyed from the police department, uh, who was the custodian of the flag, to the Society of California Pioneers. Uh, and, uh, and at that point, the city did not have uh, any uh, public uh, museum space uh, where such a flag could be displayed. And it was just by common consent that, yes, the Pioneers were probably the most obvious place to put it. But in 1975, uh, shortly after the, the, uh, the, the main uh, public library uh, got its new uh, San Francisco History Room, uh, now known as the San Francisco History Center, uh, the city actually made a bid to get that flag back. And there was a whole custody battle uh, that went on for about a year between 75 and 76 to try to, to try to, to try to sort of, uh, sort of bring uh, the flag sort of back into a, a more truly uh, public and publicly owned uh, space. And, and eventually, uh, I think, you know, neither side was willing to give and, uh, and it just sort of went nowhere. But, uh, but, but the pioneers do still have that flag, although unfortunately it's, uh, uh, they say it's in deep storage. So you can't, you can't actually see it, but they did, they did put it under glass and frame it and all of that, but it's, uh, it's not part of their permanent exhibit. Well, luckily they change their exhibits out a lot. So maybe we'll, with, yeah. with some pressure, we can convince yes. them to yeah. unearth it. Love to see it. Now, Brian, I have a question for you. You have um, your website, urbanlifedesigns.com. You're selling your flag there. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's actually, uh, my website is Urban Life Signs, like medical life signs. It's very, I thought it was a great name, but it can get confusing. Okay. But the flag is on um, sffoggoldflag.com. That's sffoggoldflag.com. So there's two double Fs, a double F and a double G in there. I got it. Um, and, and how that, much are they selling for? So apparently the, everybody wants to go big. I thought they'd want to go a little smaller. Uh, they're the large three by five foot flag goes for ninety eight dollars. It's uh, in nylon, two hundred denier, and um, I've gotten over almost two hundred orders now. Um, I'm about to go for make another request for ship, you know, for printing of them because I'm bat backlogged, but that should be arriving, you know, in the coming weeks to deliver to folks um, and. Uh, Thanks to Peter Hartlob of the Chronicle for making the piece on me and the flag itself and its meaning, because that I don't I think I might have gotten forty orders without that. So um, that that's uh, it's much more success than I th imagined that it would happen. But you can also get smaller sizes: a two by three foot, um, a small one by one and a half foot flag, or even uh, mini flags that you can wave around with your with a stick on it. I look forward to my copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I put um, the Peter Hartlab article in the chat um, and I had another question for you, but it has gone from my mind. Um, are there any other questions from the attendees? A lot of uh, nice things that people enjoyed the talk so far. All right, no one's, no one's chatting with me saying yes, they had questions. Um, well, thanks you guys, this is pretty, pretty awesome. And I look, forward to, uh, I look forward to getting my flag. Yeah. But I also look forward to you know, hearing how, how, in, how your research in this vein progresses. I know for me, I, the two things that I would love, I think what John's research recently with all those photographs from the teens and 20s and 30s has really filled out some of the gaps. You know, it's not full, but it's the past. You can't always get it. What I would love to see is, well, what did that 1940 flag look like where they first put the word San Francisco on it? I'm sure it didn't look dramatically different, but it'd be great to see it flying somewhere so we can confirm. And then secondly, is that seal or the flag quoted pre-1807, uh, it was 1859 or 1850s? 59. What did the seal look like that got changed? And what is this San Francisco city flag that's mentioned in some report? Yeah, there was one, one of the little, the little tidbits uh, that I found was that there, there, was a, there was an article from August of 1900 uh, where, where the old uh, city hall uh, on uh, Kearney Street, uh, across from Portsmouth Square, uh, was being torn down uh, to build uh, the new city hall. And somebody uh, in the ruins discovered what the article called the, the original city flag. So I don't know if that was the one from 59 or from 62 or from some later uh, point, but, but that was at least some uh, record that there was an actual physical flag somewhere. You know, I'm just wondering if it wouldn't make sense to uh, contact the Monterey, Monterey Public Library, um, because they have a history room also. And I just suspect that a lot of the records prior to San Francisco becoming a, a city, um, you know, under Mexican rule that that Monterey would have whatever draft <laughs> seals or flags, um, right. they might have have that material. All right, well, it looks like the questions have dried up, right. um, but I'm sure that questions will percolate as people digest what you've said. Um, so I, I just wanna direct all of our attendees to click on the links that I've provided in the chat room and uh, you can contact both gentlemen um, today. They have contact information there.
but yeah, we can't wait to see a new city flag. And please let me know if I can help you uh, connect you with other folks that might be interested in hosting you for a talk. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Institute too. Thanks, Taryn. You're very welcome. And we look forward to, um, to more. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank all right. And I just want to shout out thanks to all our attendees. And if you enjoyed the talk today, please check out Mechanics Institute's website. We have a lot of more, a lot more programming uh, coming up, and that is milibrary.org. Cheers. Okay. Have a good afternoon. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Mm.